Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about the program. This, uh, the, uh, the early afternoon program uh, really excited me, let's say, brought me back to my biochemistry history. Uh, but I'm also happy to share with you some of the things that are happening in the manufacturing uh, space right now. In the manufacturing, uh, we are uh, looking at a, a situation where we are used to, uh, let's say, having a linear economy where we use typically petrochemical feedstocks and end up with a product and generating quite a bit of waste. And on top of that, a lot of CO2 emissions. And what you see now is that we're moving towards a circular, circular economy where we try to reuse as much as possible the materials that we make and also at the end of life, uh, turn that into CO2, uh, maybe, but then also recapture that CO2. I don't know if you know this, uh, this picture that you see in front of you. That is the actual uh, global temperature relative to average from 1850 to this date. On the left-hand side, you see it all blue, so sometimes it's, it's normal, sometimes it's even cooler. But on the right-hand side, and this goes beyond statistical error, as I can uh, easily convince you, we are really heating up the planet in, in a way that is no longer sustainable. So we have to move to different ways of manufacturing uh, because the, the industry has a responsibility in this. We also have to realize that the petrochemical industry took over 80 years and maybe even close to 100 years to become as efficient as it nowadays is. Uh, so there's oil comes in and there's a lot of products that come out. If you want to go to bio-based manufacturing using agrochemical feedstocks, um, uh, agricultural feedstocks, you see that we have not by far reached that efficiency yet. And so that's why at, we at Corbion are very glad that we joined uh, the Biovia uh, two years ago to really help us with innovation speed up. And we don't have that 80 to 100 years to become as efficient, so we have to do it faster and more efficient. And I think especially the, the data analysis tools that we got supplied by, uh, by the salt systems have helped us a lot in that. So. Um, yeah, we are a, a listed company, and I'm giving you some forward-looking statements. So that's the legal department wants me to put that there. There are a couple of challenges, and some of these challenges we try to address as a company. One of them is food waste. As you know, more than 30% of the food that is produced is not uh, being eaten. And so there's a lot that is lost already during production. And we throw away a banana that is uh, in not the right shape. Uh, if, uh, if our peppers uh, are not looking great, then we throw it away. So that I think is a, is a big issue. Um, a second one is plastics. Plastics consumption and the way we actually treat plastics. And because plastics, in, this, in essence, it's not a bad material. If you look at it as a packaging material to prevent food waste, it's actually pretty good. But single use is really an issue. And as Jennifer also stated uh, earlier, we have to do something about it. It's really not, uh, not uh, at the right uh, level as we do it right now. And this is a picture from Greenland. This used to be a glacier. Uh, it is really no longer uh, a thing that you can deny. Climate change is happening. And uh, I'm living in the Netherlands. Our headquarters in Amsterdam and our major R&D and manufacturing location are below sea level. So you can imagine that a lot of people inside Corbium are totally motivated to make sustainability happen. So I will not spend a lot of words on this one because Jennifer also explained that we have to do something more than just the pledges that were made in the Paris 2015 treaty. If all the countries that signed up at that point in time would adhere to their promises, we would still end up with 3.3 to 3.9 to degrees centigrade global warming, which is not acceptable. And we have to go below two and preferably to one and a half. So the only way to really do this is that we have to have technologies that actually capture CO2. So I think that is a joint message that we both have. I'd like to ask you a question. Who of you know Corbion? Well, that's a few hands, but I'm not surprised. We are a B2B company. So we supply intermediates to the food industry, to materials industry, biomedical industries. But typically, we're not on the package. We don't have a brand in that sense that is known to uh, consumers. So that's why I wanted to introduce you to, co to the company in a small movie. Can I have sound, please? in a 
healthier, more sustainable world. A smarter use of natural resources and greater respect for the planet. We believe in food that's as fresh, healthy and safe as can be. With minimal waste, using natural ingredients. We believe that fossil-based materials should be replaced by bio-based solutions. So everything from sportwear, coffee cups and car dashboards to coatings, medical devices and hand soap is produced using renewable alternatives. We're developing new bio-platforms on a grand scale so that the successful solutions we have today make it out of the lab and into the very fabric of our lives. We are creating the building blocks for today and tomorrow with major strides towards a smaller carbon footprint. We are teaming up with customers to tailor our technologies to meet their needs and bring innovation to life. We're researching, developing and breaking barriers to deliver tomorrow's products today. Designed by science, powered by nature, always keeping people and the environment in mind. Now and always. Now. So just to, uh, to finish with that introduction, we are the world's largest producer of lactic acid that you may know from if you do sports, you typically get muscle pain. So it's a, it's a body, uh, let's say it's an endogenous compound that we all know. It is used and it has been used over centuries to preserve food. The salami with sausage is an example of that. In cheese, yogurts, it's actually preserving those types of products. It's also used in, uh, in bread preservation. But we also use it in different ways. So we make solvents for the electronics industry based on lactic acid. And we do that because the, sol the solvency characteristics of that solvent are really great for the electronics industry. And we can tune the polarity of the solvents by adding different alcohols to it. So we make ethyl lactate for electronics. We can make butyl lactate for agrochemicals. So there's all kinds of, let's say, renewable, uh, biocompatible solvents that we can make in that way. That's uh, done in the biochemical space, where we also produce biomedical materials. And they're used and resorbed also by the natural body. You know, the surgical threads in the past, we used to be operated, and then you have to be re-operated to remove the stitches. Nowadays, the stitches dissolve by themselves, because they're made out of at least partly polylactic acid. And so they dissolve in the body, and they are basically uh, then removed by the liver. What we've also done is we've created a, uh, so that's food ingredients is, is the more traditional business. Biochemicals is the, let's say, adjacencies that we're trying to develop right now. And we've created also a platform called Innovation Platforms, where we are developing new materials and also algae ingredients to really add to our portfolio. And there we have developed polylactic acid as a, as a new polymer. Uh, uh, it's not really that new in that sense. You could say NatureWorks has been in this market for quite a while, but it's new for us. Yeah, so it really, we have created and erected last year a 75 kiloton plant. We do that together with Total. Yeah, so we have a joint venture with Total to, to make this happen. And we're very happy with that because we did not have a lot of material uh, knowledge in that space. So Total is helping us with that, uh, with that uh, uh, transition. So um, what we've also done is we have uh, embraced two of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Number two, zero hunger. And number 12 responsible consumption and production. And why did we take those? Because they fit our uh, purpose really well. So what we're doing in Zero Hunger is, for instance, we are working on algae-based protein, which is a vegan protein source that you can actually, uh, that has a high quality and, and low, uh, it has a nice uh, neutral taste relative to uh, some of the plant-based proteins that are out there. We are working on extended shelf life. I told you about uh, the, the meat preservation, but it also happens in food. We're working on antifungals, so in, also in cereals. We throw away a lot of bread, and those are the things we're also working on. Uh, we, have, we are developing compounds to keep uh, nitrogen in the soil. You know that if you, do, if you add a fertilizer, typically a lot of the nitrogen is flushed away with the, with the groundwater. We would like to have controlled release fertilizer. We're working together with our PLA polymer and uh, our fertilizer producers to make sure that that nitrogen is dosed in a more appropriate way. And we're also working on algae-based fish feeds. We produce omega-3 fatty acids, or fatty oils, you could say, 
uh, as, as a replacement of uh, fish oil that is currently being used. And we can replace 40 tons of fish oil by a dedicated omega-3 product from our algae, so one ton of algae oils. So we feel that, that uh, those are really things that, uh, that add to that zero hunger. If you then look at the SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, that is really about the circular economy. How can we make that happen? How can we, in a different way, use resources than we currently do? So moving from this thing that you see in the middle, starting from a petrochemical feedstock and turning it into products into a more, let's say, recyclable uh, bio-based economy. So on the right-hand side, the, the blue circle is really, if we make materials, let's make sure that we reuse them as much as possible, thereby basically reducing the amount of, of fresh oil that we need, virgin oil, to produce new materials. On the left-hand side, however, we also realize that that circle can never, never be 100%. There's always losses. If you want to generate a circular economy and you cover those losses with petrochemical feedstocks, you don't make it circular. Those new feedstocks have to be also renewable. And that's why we said, why don't we combine the bio-based economy using bio-based material as starting materials to really replenish the things that we're losing. And this is a graph from the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So what we're trying to do is decouple plastics from fossil feedstocks. That's the first one. Create an effective after-use plastics economy. How can we recycle it as much as possible if you have to use it? And certainly, and that's most important and most visible to most people, also drastically reduce plastic leakage. And that is really a thing that we should prevent. So if you look now at uh, polylactic acid as an example, if you compare polylactic acid to polystyrene, in this graph you see that for uh, a ton of uh, polystyrene or for a kilogram of polystyrene, you have a CO2 emission of 2.2 uh, kilograms per kilogram of, of, of product made. The plates, I noticed that, that were served today, where we had our lunch uh, today, they were made out of polystyrene. I would suggest the organization next year to use polylactic acid. <laughs> so polylactic acid today has a, um, an emission of 0.5 kilograms per kilogram of product, and our mission is actually to bring that to zero. And zero is, of course, not negative, but the point is we can make lactic acid with a negative emission, but not yet polylactic acid, so we're aiming there for, for, uh, for zero. And so um, the other thing we're trying to do is use algae to make oils. As you know, plant oils are uh, produced also in regions where uh, there's a lot of pressure on ecosystems. Uh, palm oil is a notorious example of that. And algae oils, they are tunable. Using modern biotechnology, you can actually make a lot of oils in a very efficient way using algae. So that's one of our innovation streams that we're currently developing. But I want to bring you back to lactic acid. So historically, we used to produce lactic acid in Horkum, which is our major production site in the Netherlands, and we had 333 kilograms of CO2 emitted per ton of lactic acid made. And we're using sugar beets. Um, they, uh, and that is basically uh, 1.4 tons of, uh, of uh, let's say, stored CO2. Uh, the CO2 is stored from the from the air in, in the plant, and we're using that as a raw material. So in the, in the life cycle assessment, you can count it as a negative. Then it goes to the sugar mill, our lactic acid plant, and we make lactic acid. And one of the major contributors to this is that we need to produce, or we need to use lime. And if you make lactic acid, an acid in a fermentation process, you have to add lime to make sure that that, buffer, that buffers the whole system so that your organisms, because we, we do this with microorganisms, that they don't die during the production process. As we need a lot of lime, and of course lime takes a lot of energy to make, and it also takes a lot of energy to get it to the plant. If you now take our new plant, we, we are producing lactic acid in Rayong, in Thailand, where we uh, are using sugar cane right now, that is transported to the sugar mill. That sugar mill is actually using the bagasso of the, of the sugar cane, so the, the waste material, they're using that as a feedstock to generate energy, and so heat, to get the sugar out of the, out of the, uh, out of the cane. So you see that, that that local situation leads then to a situation that if you look over the whole process, we have minor, minus 224 kilograms of CO2 emitted per, kilo, per ton uh, lactic acid made. And so here you see that net, we're actually fixing CO2 in that, in that product. But that doesn't end it. Here again, we still need lime. Uh, and, we, uh, and what we then said is, if we want to make a real much more green process, we should get rid of that lime step. So what we've done is we have developed a process 
that is no longer using lime. So actually, we have a trick to, to harvest the lactic acid during production. And as such, we don't need to, because then it's away from the microorganisms, so it's no longer harmful to the microorganisms, and we don't need to add this buffering component. If we do that we, in our current plant, and that's the next one that we're going to build, we are um, looking at minus 307 kilograms of CO2 emitted per ton of lactic acid. But that's not the end of it, because this is still making use of, let's say, the traditional sources of energy. If we would do, let's say, if we would use renewable energy and also renewable heat, and in this case we would also be projecting that we will use hydrogen, and of course it has to be sustainable hydrogen, and so preferably uh, from sources that are, uh, being, are able to support that, we can actually go to over a, a ton of, of fixed CO2 per ton of produced lactic acid if we do this really well. And there are not so many processes that can do that. And why is that the case? Because we are having an anaerobic process to make lactic acid. It's close to 100% yield. There are not so many fermentation processes that can do that. Plus, we're using all of these uh, uh, energy sources that I just described that are sustainable as well and making use to the, uh, of the uh, CO2 that is fixed in the green plant. So this is one of those examples where we believe that, uh, that this is the way to go to look at, uh, at chemical manufacturing. And if we want to replace polystyrene, which is actually from a performance characteristic, polylactic acid is actually a very suitable replacement of uh, polystyrene. Well, if we could replace 10% uh, of the polystyrene market, we would be very, very happy already. So the way we look at it, we feel that, uh, that biomass and making use of agricultural feedstocks as renewable sources are uh, key to, uh, to uh, really develop some negative emission technologies to make new materials. And it's very important to close the loop in the circular economy. As I said before, you cannot really close the circular economy with petrochemical feedstocks. That would be totally against the philosophy of that. And so we, we feel that we need to do this. Uh, carbon capture and sequestration from concentrated CO2 sources, and was uh, d discussed by Jennifer as well before, if you have that concentration, then, then the technology that we have today is already pretty close to being competitive. But if you have a diluted source, let's not forget biomass, because plants are already capturing that CO2. They're doing that very inefficiently, uh, but it is, in, in a sense, you could say it is, it is at low cost, so you could really use that as a green feedstock. And so coupling the bio-based economy and the circular economy in our philosophy is really a thing that we should do. And uh, we sometimes see a lot of people advocating the circular economy but forgetting that they need to replenish the losses, as if you can have a 100% closed cycle. And as you know, if you look at recycling, we're currently far off from 100%. It's only uh, it's below 10% and in many countries even below 5%. So we really have to step up there. So with that, I'd like to close, and uh, thank you for your attention.